South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a common thing. Revolutionary greetings uh, to everyone in South Africa, Africa and the diaspora. My name is Umpile Maute. I'm the Treasurer General of the Economic Freedom Fighters. We come to you from the EFF studios at uh, Winnie Madigzela Mandela House in Johannesburg. Today is a very special day. We are joined by one of our own, the Judge President, a revolutionary in his own right who really fought Apartheid system, to this day, he's still fighting. Uh, we are joined by Judge Klope, the Judge President of the Western Cape. Judge, greetings Th to you. Thank you very much, TG, or shall I use your official title, Princess Mahutwe. Thank you very <laughs> much. I appreciate the invitation. I take nothing for granted. Thank you very much for having me in your studio. So let's start by talking about the... Uh, Judge Klope, yes. uh, born in Stenga in KZN, late in the late 50s. So just briefly tell us about how you grew up, especially in the apartheid South Africa. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I was born on the 19th of May, 1959, uh, in a small town called Guatuguza. It used to be called Stenga. It's north of Deben. And I grew up poor like most South Africans. And my parents were very poor, and my father was a security guard, and uh, he worked as a traditional healer as well. So be careful when you engage me. I might do something, some black magic one way <laughs> or the other. And my mother never went to school. She worked as a domestic worker. Prior to that, she used to be a gardener. We grew up poor. And then, obviously, my first interaction with white people is when I worked as a farm laborer. I started working uh, weeding sugarcane fields at the age of 12. At the age of 12, I could carry 12 kilograms of fertilizer on my back, and I never looked back. We used to work very hard, even Christmas and public holidays. There were just no holidays, considering that there were no labor laws then. Mm. And of course, this is perhaps I'm moving a little bit ahead, and being exposed to such, to such working conditions, poor working conditions, it made me open up my mind. It opened up my mind, and then I started looking around me what was going on. The white gentleman I was working for was chairperson of the South African Sugar Association. Mm -hmm. He's late now. He was filled the rich. Uh, he even helped me in terms of uh, financing my education to a point where I finished my LLB degree. But indirectly, he also helped me because he opened up my mind. I was able to look around and see how he discriminated between different uh, race groups in terms of workers. He had an Indian foreman and every other supervisor was Indian. And Africans like me who were laborers, accommodation for Africans who lived in the compound, it was just one room. Mm. Indians had four or five room accommodation. There was a huge disparity even in the salaries. Right, My mother, for example, worked there. She was earning 11 rand 40 cents a week when she died in 1980, whereas mm. Indians were earning far more. That helped me in terms of understanding mm. that there is discrimination in terms of how we are treated. Black people are really not taken seriously. There was discrimination. So that opened up my mind. My Could we eyes. say that's probably the reason that inspired you to pursue a legal um uh, career or yes. what could have been the inspiration? TG, that was partly a reason it inspired me because mm -hmm. I wanted to do something about it. I suddenly had a passion. I wanted to do something and I wanted to be better. right? And also he used to, I must, I've said this on so many occasions, one of his nephews used to come to the farm and I would wash his car. He happened to be a lawyer. Sure. I said to myself, one day I will look like that white man and drive my own car. And indeed, I succeeded. Then. So you were one of the first, if not the first black judge, 
um, you know, to be permanently appointed at the Western Cape province. Yes, I was the very first African to be appointed permanently as a judge hmm. uh, in the new dispensation. Prior to that, the only other African who was appointed was Pius Langa. He was appointed straight to the Constitutional Court. I, see. I was appointed straight to the High Court. I was the first African in and how has your experience been? I'm knowing very well how racist uh, that province is. It has been hell, to say the least. Uh, transformation, we all know, in the Western Cape is painfully very slow. And if you champion transformation like I've done that for the past 29 years, you immediately become the enemy hmm. of the establishment. They don't want any changes in the Western Cape. Pol uh, white politicians in the Western Cape, as you would know, uh, Princess Mahutwe, they still refer to black people as uh, uh, immigrants yeah. who come from the north, who are all South Africans, but in the eyes of a lot of uh, white politicians in the Western Cape who are all foreigners because the Western Cape is meant for them. So it has been hell all the way, but I'm not going to stop fighting for that which is just and you may. Yo, um, do you believe your appointment um, to the court contributed to the transformation of South Africa's judiciary in one way or the other? I would like to believe yes, TJ, because immediately after I was appointed, I didn't rest. There were mm. so many other people that I opened the way for them. It is no exaggeration that in the Western Cape, about 70% of the judges are black, right? I'm using the term black generically to yeah. include Africans, to include Indians and coloreds. And the whites are, are of 33 judges. I think we have seven whites. So I have transformed the bench significantly in terms of race and gender, considering that a lot of people that I recruited to that bench subsequently left. A good example, Chief Justice Sandy Lengobo, he started mm. his career in Cape Town. I recruited him to the bench. The current Deputy Chief Justice Mandi Samaya started her career in the Western Cape. I recruited her. She served her acting stint under me. I was already the JP. So I believe I have done uh, reasonably enough, but it's never more than enough. Yeah. There's still room for improvement. But I tried my best to transform the division. So would you say the progress you made in the Western Cape um, how do you compare it with other provinces? Has there been any significant progress like the Western Cape no, in the with, rest of the country? With or respect still... to my colleagues, they know it. Where I excel, they don't even exist. I have done. Where I excel, they don't even exist. I have done so much transformation in the Western Cape, considering that a lot of judges who served there were subsequently released by me, so to say, to serve in other courts. Mm. And I've had so many initiatives. Quite frankly, there is no court which is transformed like the Western Cape, purely in terms of race and gender. Talking about the second element of transformation, which is yeah. the mind and the mindset, that's another issue, yeah. another debate for another day. So I believe I've done reasonably well in terms of transforming the court. I didn't just rest on my laurels. I came in and I opened the doors for a lot of other black people who came after me. So, Judge, you've served the judiciary for over 25 years. Well, to be exact, this is my 30th year. I was appointed. Year. Yes, I've been on the bench for 29 years. I'm looking at the young men over there who are not even born. <laughs> <laughs> so, which are the cases years. that you presided over that you would say they are standing out? Uh, and and why would you think that they are standing out? You've just presented over I'm so a lot sorry. of cases. Yeah. I'm so sorry, TG, uh, to speak over you. I will just mention two cases. They are both on constitutional law, and I will give reasons why I think they stand out. One case is called, uh, uh, it had to do, uh, all right, let me start with the case which had to do with, uh, there is an act called PI, Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act. Yeah. In terms of this act, there must be written and an effective notice given to the occupier before that occupier can be uh, evicted from the house which they are occupying unlawful. The section provides that it must be a written and effective notice. In the Cape Kilani matter, that's one judgment I'm boasting about, 
the respondents, that is the people sought to be evicted, were Tosa-speaking mm. people. The only language they were fluent in in this world, which is an, which is an official language, was in his toss. Yet the notices of eviction uh, were arrogantly sent to them in Africans. Wow. So when I sat on the bench, I looked at this. Notices evicting people who are only fluent in Isitosa, which is one of the 11 official languages, is sent to them in the Afrikaans. Mm. Then I asked counsel, is this an effective notice? Then I adjourned the court. After lunch, counsel was very good. He took exactly the point which I raised. Notice which is sent to you, if, mm. for example, you are speaking Isitswana, and you don't understand any language other than your own official language, which is an official language. Notice must be sent to you in a language that you understand. There was an appeal. The appeal went nowhere. That judgment is being followed all over the world, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah. In other words, the law now, which I initiated in that matter, if notice is going to be given to someone yeah. to be evicted, it must be given in the official language of that particular person. I'm Zulu, notice must be given to me in Zulu. You speak uh, Sizwana, notice will have to be given in Sizwana. That for me was victory for the poor people, very small victory. The other one it concerned African women. Uh, it's called Zozo, Z-O-Z-O. Here was an African woman who was being ill-treated by her husband. Mm. In uh, in the sense that each time she would take, it had to do with maintenance. Each time she would take off at work and uh, the, the husband uh, to go to court, yeah. there was a maintenance inquiry. So each time she goes there, there would be a story. The husband is not available. He was ducking and diving all the time. And this went on for about two years. Mm. So when the matter came to me, I asked one question to counsel. I said... There is a right to dignity. Here is this poor African woman. There is evidence that she has been going to the maintenance court for two years. And each time the husband keeps ducking and diving. Why can't his pension, right, be ring fast and be kept for this poor woman? Right? Hmm. That was a groundbreaking judgment. You have your pension, yeah. which is there, is being held by your employer. But then you are playing around, uh, avoiding your responsibility to pay maintenance. The law as it stands, which I developed was, your pension is going to be confiscated. It will be given to the wife as per the means. That I regard as victory for women and especially poor African women. There are many other cases, obviously, yeah. after almost eight years on the bench. But yeah, let me just concentrate on, on the two. two. No, right. that's a significant... A progress, I must say, that you make. Thank you, Princess. So, uh, in the course of the journey that you've travelled, uh, there are times where you face legal matters yourself, yes. against yourself. Yes. Um, could you maybe enlighten us on one or two of them and what were the issues and how are you resolving them? Well, I think the, the issue that everybody knows, it has to do with... Uh, the long-standing case against me relating to allegations against me that I tried improperly to influence judges in the constitutional court. That started in the year 2008. It is still going on even today because, as you know, I was suspended following that. But the interesting thing what is... What do you mean you were suspended? Are you suspended? I'm still on suspension. You're still on suspension. Yes, I'm still on okay. suspension. Perhaps allow me to, to, to elaborate on that. Yeah. I'll spend a minute or so. When this thing started in 2008, I went on suspension. I took voluntary suspension. I, I was see. off the bench for 18 months. I was cleared by the JSC on the 29th of September 2009. Then I went back and worked. Between September 2009 and last year, which was the uh, the seventeenth of December, sorry, the year before last, because I was suspended on the seventeenth of December, twenty twenty two. Okay. So between two thousand and nine and then, I've been working, doing my work. Nothing else has happened. So what happened after I was cleared? There came interlopers. That is the DA, uh, Freedom Under the Law, Under Justice Krechler, the Democratic Alliance, and Helen Zeller. 
they brought this thing back again and they started all over. They litigated. Helen Zilla claimed that she is the premier of the Western Cape. Mm. She did not participate. She did not sit on the judiciary based on that technicality and others. The thing started all over again. Now, when I was suspended by President Ramaphosa, uh, uh, it was clear to me that that was for political reasons. And I will tell you why I'm saying that. Yeah. Two reasons why I'm saying that. President Ramaphosa is a politician. He is the head of state. So whenever he takes a decision, it is a political, political decision. decision. I number see. One. Number two, it is unconscionable, unheard of in any civilized world that a person can be suspended for two separate occasions in mm. respect of the same thing. Yeah. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. It is clear to me he did not act lawfully, but he acted politically. He was bowing to some political pressure. Perhaps I can indicate that we challenge that. Okay. We brought an application to court. Even today, we have not been given a hearing in the in the uh, Houghton Court, which is headed by Dunstan Mlamp. And Parliament, is Parliament doing anything? Parliament wants to proceed and impeach me. The, uh, our position is very clear. There are, there are so many legal processes. Mm -hmm. There are so many cases that are going on. Any decision now to impeach me will be premature because it will be final. We can no longer deal with that. So there is no rush. I don't understand what they are rushing. So what happens if they go ahead with the impeachment process? What legal recourse do you have? Well, if they go ahead with that, we I, we have brought an action against them. We have brought an application to stop them. Okay. Right? We have done that. Papers were served the day before yesterday. We hope sanity is going to prevail because this is no. It's just a political thing. And why do you think you have been pursued like that, JP? Uh, as I said earlier on, in the Western Cape, uh, it is a it's a foreign land for black people, and if you go there. You, you rock the boat, you, are, you advocate transformation, you pioneer transformation, you are going to be the enemy of the establishment. There was a time that Helen Zilla said people are immigrants um, yes. who come to the Western Cape. I'm sure she was referring to me and others. <laughs> and how do you feel about that? Well, it's an insult. It's yeah. worse to be told by a white person with yeah. respect. There is not a single African who is an immigrant in Africa. It's worse to be told by a white person that you're an immigrant in Africa. I see. It's an insult to say the least. So we've we've talked a lot about you and what yes. you've been through, where you come from, how you were brought up, what are the challenges you faced. Let's talk now about South Africa. What is your opinion of the state of South Africa, socially, economically, and and otherwise? So what what is your opinion? Well, there is a lot. That's quite a broad question. Socially. Uh, I think there is a lot that can be done and that must be done. It's 30 years of independence. Yeah. If one walks around, especially in rural areas, I must say I'm from rural areas as well and I'm no stranger to rural areas. I go to any area where, whenever I get an opportunity. But in case after case, wherever you go, you see poverty, you see naked children, dusty roads, it's all over. That, to me, is clear evidence that those areas, nothing has happened in terms of development after 30 years. And that, for me, is a serious challenge, right? And we need to do something quite radical about that. And I'm sure part of the problem is that those poor communities don't have access to decent land. They don't have access to arable land. And I'm sure we'll talk about land later. So socially, I think uh, there are a lot of challenges facing the government, the new government, and I'm glad there's an election, and I hope South Africans are not going to be fooled. They will realize that as far as socioeconomic conditions, black people and Africans in particular are still far from being satisfied. There's still a long way to go. The list is endless. It mm. ranges from unemployment, housing, socio-economic ills, violence in our communities. Part of the violence, of course, 
is linked to socioeconomic conditions, crimes or violence. There are crazy crimes, right? But general research all over the world shows that crimes of violence are linked to socioeconomic conditions. So there is a lot that pro poverty, socioeconomic conditions, does to our communities, right? So much about socioeconomic conditions that I think there is a lot that one can say, as I say, ranging from unemployment, mm. housing, amenities. You still have uh, some of our clinics, for instance, healthcare facilities. You still have lots of communities where clinics would close at four o'clock yeah. during the day. You ask yourself if a woman were to give birth and have complications at five past four or at five o'clock and it's pouring rain, the road is not tarred, who will take care of that woman? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen reports of women giving birth That's right. just outside the clinics because just the clinic outside. was open. Was, just was, out, was closed. Just outside. And and that's the kind of government that we have of the day. And are they doing anything about it in your view to change that status quo? Well, they are doing something. Let's give the government credit. They have done uh, quite a lot. But whether or not it is satisfactory, it's definitely not satisfactory. My view is clear. They should have done far more than what they have done. That is not to say they have done nothing. Mm. They have done something, but in 30 years, with all due respect, they should have done far more than what they have done, tenfold. Now, Judge uh, Dr. Tlope, you are known to be passionate about the issue of the land, which you spoke about earlier on. Yes. What's your view on the land um, as it stands here currently in South Africa? You've got a constitution right in front of you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sure you'll over first. <laughs> you may. I'm sure you'll open the constitution at some point to refer yes. us to the clause in the constitution that speaks about the land and where we find ourselves in as a country and what we need to do to change the status quo. Well, thank you very much, Princess Mahuto. That's a very important question. I'm very passionate about land. Fellow South Africans, I brought this constitution today because I believe the answer to land lies exactly in the constitution. Mm. Now... A lot of people are not legally trained. I'm going to explain something now. Allow yeah. me to do that. Yeah. A constitution is an act of parliament. The only difference between a constitution and other acts of parliament is that this is the supreme law of the land. Section 2 of the constitution says that. In other words, there is no other act of parliament. If that act conflicts with the constitution, the constitution will prevail. Mm. It is the supreme law of the land. That's the first thing I want to say. Secondly, a constitution is an act of parliament. It was passed by parliament. parliament. So when you interpret the constitution, it is interpreted in exactly the same way as you would interpret other acts, whether it is the Criminal Procedure Act of 1977 or the Divorce Act, it doesn't matter. The principles of interpretation are exactly the same. Yeah. In other words, you do not, for argument's sake, say, all right, Section 26 of the Constitution deals with housing, and you just go to Section 26. You look at other provisions, mm -hmm. including the preamble. Remember, there is no right which is absolute. Yeah. For example, you have got the right not to be defamed by me, yeah. right? You have got the right to play your music at home, but the moment you play your music in such a way that it deserves the entire neighbor, you are committing a nuisance. There is no right which is absolute. Absolute, absolutely. Now, having said that, let's go to the Constitution. Our Constitution is very clear. Firstly, I want to say, before I take you through the Constitution, before we were colonized, right, various African nationalities lived in what is today known as South Africa through the length and breadth of South Africa. The evidence is conclusive. For example, in the Eastern Cape, we all know there were at least eight major wars mm. that were fought by the people of the Eastern Cape resisting uh, infiltration by the foreigners, the, the, the settlers, right? So when that happened, whenever they went, we lost, and we lost the war. They confiscated the Brilliant. land. Yeah. So the strategy was fight with them. When they lose, you confiscate the land and push them and push them all the way back. For example, Zululand was annexed 
in 1879, mm. right? So long after 1652, we all know why there yeah. was resistance, especially by Shaga in those areas. There is not a single part of South Africa that was handed over to European settlers. We fought for our land, right? Mm. So that's the background I want to give you. Yeah. And then, then came the constitution. Oh, sorry, just before the constitution, in 1909, the ANC was formed. Why it was formed? It was because, among other things, chief among other things, for forming the ANC was the question of land. Of the land. Mm. They were excluded. Quite rightly, the ANC leaders said, we're excluded, were black people, let's form the African National Congress. In 1959, the PAC was formed on the 6th of April. 11 months thereafter, uh, on the 21st of, April, of March 1960, it was the Sharpville Massacre. Mm. Underlying the formation of the PAC was the question of land. 1976, Soweto Uprising. Mm -hmm. You will recall that the first accused was Zaf Motupeng, mm. who was the leader of the PC. It just shows even the 1976 uprisings underlying that was the question of land. EFF. Yeah. EFF, you've just celebrated 10 years of existence. By the way, congratulations. You have done Thank an you. excellent job in the country. Right? Why was EFF born? It was again the issue of land and transformation of the key sectors of, of the economy. economy. So I've given that long background. There is not a single South African who's fair-minded who can disagree with that. Mm. these are facts. Mm. Then came the constitution in 1994 against that background. Now let's look at the provisions of the constitution. I'll be very quick. The preamble to the constitution, yeah. it tells us where we're coming from and what we're all about. Right. It says the following. It says we recognize the injustices of the past. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mention... That's the constitution? The, yes. Here is in the preamble. Okay. Right at, start, at the start of the preamble to the constitution, it says we, South Africans, recognize the injustices, injustices of, of the past. past. But it doesn't tell us what are those injustices. You and I know racism yeah. was grave injustice in South Africa. Black people were treated like trash, yeah. were not treated as human beings before 1994. The second injustice was sexism. Mm. Women were and still are treated not quite the same as men. There is clear evidence, for example, that in certain areas of employment, women earn less than men, right? That's discrimination, right? Right. That's what you experienced back in the days. Yes, that was what we experienced back in the days. But there is evidence that there are certain employers or certain yeah. sectors in day. the economy, yeah. even today, yeah. which pay women less than men. That is undoubtedly another evil of the past, which existed, is still exists. existing. Land. I've given you, with due respect, a detailed history of how yeah. it started. Mm. Land is not specifically mentioned in the preamble as one of these evils of the past. But I challenge anyone who says land is not an evil. What were we fighting about? Since the formation of the ANC in 1909, PAC in 1959, Soweto Uprising in 1976, EFF 10 years ago. What was the struggle about? It was not about tenders. Mm -mm. It was not about living in posh areas. Mm -mm. It was land. So the preamble to me is very clear, right? It guides us. It tells us. It gives us a sense of direction. This is where we're coming from. This is where we're going as a nation, right? Now, let us move. It, there are various sections as well in the mm. preamble which speaks to social justice. I don't know how we can say we have social justice when there is no land, right? All of that is in the preamble. Now, I want to take the preamble yeah. and read it with Section 25 of the Constitution. Okay. I'm about to finish. Section 25 of the Constitution is very, very clear. It basically says there will no, no land will be expropriated from anybody except through an act of general application and there must be payment of compensation. Now, That's I'm, the current Constitution? Yes, here it is. And there must be... It goes on to spell it out, how you pay compensation as so that you look at the history of the land, its use now, yeah. how was it acquired and the value of the land and so on. I'm going to identify at least three categories of property to you now, okay. which are lying there, which can be the subject of expropriation without compensation immediately. If a person is committing a crime, 
in South Africa. For example, I have guns, lots of them. I'm a hunter, right? If I take any of my guns and shoot and kill you, the gun will be confiscated immediately mm. pending the duration of the trial. Upon being convicted, I will forfeit that gun to the state. I will never get it again. Mm. Why is that not done in respect of the land? Section 300 of the Criminal Procedure Act provides that any property which is the proceed of crime yeah. may be forfeited. We have endless beatings of fellow African people on these farms. Some are killed, mm. others are buried in shallow graves. There is not a single farm which has ever been confiscated. That falls squarely within the Constitution. It will be confiscated in the interest of the public. There is no need for compensation yeah. because you have committed a crime. Right. Doesn't happen? Don't ask me why. I'm not a prosecutor. Prosecutors, remember, are towing the line by and large. <laughs> That's right. what Batoy said. That That's number one. <laughs> prosecutors must assist. Uh, That's, right. the... That's just the first thing. Yeah. The second, I mean, nobody can quarrel with that. That is the law. It yeah. is there. Such, in other words, if you are a Mr. Shope or Mr. X or Van der Merve, whatever the name is, and you're abusing your workers or you're committing crime, that property can be confiscated mm -hmm. without much ado. You don't deserve any compensation. I will give you a second category of property. When you look at Section 25, it gives you a lot of, it gives indications of, of what are the things that we look at, the history of acquisition. I thought that's very exciting. Yeah. When, uh, during the Second World War, when the Second World War ended, uh, the, the colonels, those who were in charge in the army, were rewarded handsomely. They were given land. Whereas our fathers were given bicycles Eish. and torches. If you are in KZN, not far from Moses Mapita Stadium, where EFF will be launching the manifesto on the, on the 10th, 10th of February, you just drive away, I would say, from Moses Mapita Stadium, about 27 to 30 Ks. There is a place near Palito. Okay. There is a place called Compensation. Oh. I asked myself last year, how did this name come? Clearly, they were compensating each other, mm. right? That's the land. That will immediately tell you how that land was acquired. They went to the Second World War, came back. They were generals. They won. They took our land. They were compensating each other. Why can't we have that land back? They didn't buy it. Mm. Instead, black people were given bicycles and torches who were fooled. What an right? insult. That's land that is readily available, the so-called compensation. Nobody can argue with that. Because when you look at Section 25, the criteria that I have referred to is covered. It's covered already. And then the last category I will give you, there are farms here which are huge. They are owned by people who have never even seen them. They live in Europe. They come here once per annum or once every three years. They are not loyal to South Africa. These farms, when you go through them, some is 85,000 hectares, 65,000 hectares, over 100 hectares. There is no doubt that people have been buying farms in order to take the land and keep it away from those who legitimately use it. Now, we need a proper land audit in this country because there are so many farms which are not gainfully used, but they were all acquired through illicit means. And it doesn't help to say, I bought it from so-and-so. We can go back to Israel. Where did that so-and-so buy it? So it goes back to original conquest and theft. So the issue of land is very important. I know I'm very vociferous. And I'm not going to stop until there's been a fair distribution of land and all the resources. We all know in terms of the Land Act, 87% of arable land was given to the whites, and we only have 18%. So I am, I am saying land is a very critical issue, and we need to have, to have an everlasting solution. And it can only happen because we address the issue of land. And I'm very glad that uh, one of the EFF comrades, Carl Niehaus, uh, is the only white person who seriously talks about land 
in my view. We need more such white people because we need to be frank and talk about it. We need each other. Africaners need us. We also need them. So we must share the land equitably, regard being had to the history of how it was acquired, and also regard being had to the fact that not all farmlands is used profitably. There are so many huge farms that are not even used profitably. So I would suggest that the sooner we engage on an ongoing dialogue on land, the better. And my view is clear. Any political party that does not address the issue of land, uh, they must re-examine themselves. I see. So, JP, you will know that, you just said it earlier on, that at the center of the struggle yes. is the land. That's right. Which became or becomes the first non-negotiable cardinal pillar of the EFF, expropriation of land without compensation. That's right. And you will know that the EFF, we've attempted several times in parliament to pass motions for the expropriation of land without compensation, which the last one, it went even beyond just being the motion. It went to through the country, through um, public hearings that confirmed what we actually stand for and agree with you and me that we need to expropriate land without compensation. But of course, we went back to parliament and the ANC, known for who they are, they sold out. Uh, when it comes to the actual amendment of Section 25 of the Constitution. So what do you make of Do you think that you are unreasonable to ask for expropriation of land without compensation? Is that something that you believe in as a human being, as an African? Yes, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And the position adopted by EFF is definitely not unreasonable. If anything, it is in line with the Constitution. I've just outlined the history of the Constitution, yeah. the preamble, and the, I've identified three categories of land that can today be expropriated in terms of the law of general amendment. The Criminal Procedure Act, that was with reference to farmers who commit crime on their farms. I've also made reference to compensation, how that land was acquired. All of that falls within the Act. To the extent that some might think that is not good enough, then there might be a need to amend Section 25. But I come from the school of thought that Section 25, as it stands, is okay, we can work with it, right? So you don't need, in my view, to amend the Constitution, but obviously we would need a specific act of parliament to deal with such expropriations if, uh, if necessary. But I wholly endorse that position. It falls within the Constitution. And, and, and sorry, EFF is not advocating violence to the no, best not. of my knowledge. Yeah, we're not. So I would support any constitutional means in terms of which we'll get our land back. And the position of EFF, which is expropriation without compensation, is entirely justified. We're not um, 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 promoting violence. That's why we went back to the same parliament That's that right. passed that law yes. to say we, we see that there's an injustice here, there's a shortage, a, a shortfall somewhere, mm. and therefore let's amend the constitution mm. to cater for expropriation of land without compensation. Now, uh, JP, uh, people will come and say, but what are you going to do with the land? Uh, such questions. How do they evoke your emotions and how would you respond to such questions? Well, I've often seen that on social media there is a young lady, I think, concerned citizen. She talks quite a lot about land. And I listened to her once, and uh, what put me off was the Model C accent. You know, you can see this is a young South African who basically uh, doesn't know much about politics, right? My sister, can I... Uh, Sorry, Princess Mawutwe, may I ask Tiji. you this question? Can I ask you, Tiji, the following question? If I steal your, your computer right now and keep it to myself, can it be open to me that, no, 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 you don't need this computer. You're not doing anything about it. It can never justify that. It can never. Yes. So those fellow South Africans, especially young black people, who say we can't use land are misdirected. I mean, I can assure you one thing. A lot of people, myself, I have a small holding, if I may talk about it very yeah, briefly. Yeah, you may. 
a small holding, in my small holding, is only 11 hectares. I don't need anything bigger than that. But I don't buy anything. The only thing I buy is toilet paper and toothpaste. So you produce everything Everything, in your farm. ranging from bees, my own fish. I've got fresh feet in a dam. I've got sheep. I've got chickens. I reprocess everything. I don't buy fertilizer. That's enough to feed me and the family. In other words, the concept of small holding mm. or subsistence farming. That's what our grand, great-grandfathers used, used to, to do. do. Yeah. And now everybody is talking about organic food, right? Meanwhile, we used to live like that before. We were colonized. And remember, there is the question of uh, money as well. Land goes hand in hand with the issue of money. Resources, yes. And resources, yeah. right? They don't want, for example, on my farm, I have basic herbs, African herbs, right? I don't buy spinach. I use impuya. You call it kale. Kale, right? Kale, yeah. It's there, right? I use pumpkin shoots. I use all of that. I don't buy cabbage from the store. I use my own. Now, in terms of medication as well, I'm lucky to have some background. I mean, I have African herbs. If I'm sick, I go to my garden and get umshonyan or riboza. Then I will not be coughing the following day. Mm. And the, uh, the pharmacist is not about to see me. I see. <laughs> so, <laughs> Very interesting. So, 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 where did we get it wrong, JP, uh, that to this day, yes. we still haven't expropriated land without compensation, that's one. But two, for those farms mm. whose government have given back to the community, mm. they lie dormant now. Nothing is happening in those farms. Yes. Because government has not had a deliberate uh, uh, effort or attitude to assist those communities. As you know, yes. back in apartheid, there used to be... They capacitated. Agri- yes, capacitated financially skills, and yes. equipment-wise and, and skills mm. to, 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 to farm. And, uh, you know, but that's not happening with the government of the day. So wh- where did we go wrong? So before I answer that, I've just remembered another category of uh, land that yeah. can be expropriated without compensation. What happened in 1994, a lot of farmers who, were, who had loans uh, using the land bank, which was in place, stopped servicing those loans. Mm-hmm. Right? But they live on those farms. You have a car, my sister, if you don't pay for your car, the bank will move yeah. in Repositive. and confiscate you. Yeah. But they are staying on those farms that's their farm. So if we were to have proper audit, we'll be able to identify those farms. That's land that belongs to the state. We mm. can go on and on. Yeah. But uh, the issue of proper land audit is being resisted in South Africa. right? So that's just one category. Mm. Nobody can deny that. If you don't pay for your house, uh, the bank will move in, yeah. you foreclose. And take it. Why can't those farms be confiscated? You don't need to confiscate. Uh, to, to, to compensate them. Now, to answer the question, your question, my view is simply this. It doesn't help to give a farm to Mr. So-and-so or so-and-so simply because he is a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. Farming is very, very involved. You need to capacitate our people. Yeah. Transfer of skills is very, very important. And I regret 30 years down the line after independence, there hasn't been much transfer of skills. And I think if you just take a community and say, here is your land, have it back, you are setting people for failure. There is a farm that I know, for example, in KZN, they asked me to assist. They want to convert it into a game farm. They got the community there, got 5,000 hectares of land. Mm. Of the 5,000 hectares of land, 3,000 hectares has already been leased back to the whites mm. who lived there exactly. before. Yeah. They are carrying on because they've got the skill, they've got cattle, they've mm. got sugar cane. So when I got there, the family this community asked me they want to start a game farm. So they gave me the 2,000 hectares that I could work with. But obviously, I don't want to go much into those details. It was very clear to me that they were set up for fail. Mm. And I ended up asking them questions. Why are you listening back these sugarcane farms back to whites? Mm. Their answer was, what are we going to do? Yeah. We don't have the capacity. They have the skill. They have the money. They have the know-how. So my view is this. It's not 
helpful to give the land back to various communities yeah. without capacitating those communities, Absolutely. without the transfer of skill. I'm just using farming yeah. as an example. Mining gets more complicated, right? And remember, every African is a farmer. There's yeah. no question about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. We all know how to farm. We all have hoes. We know. The only difference is that the white man uses more science. It's more scientific. Mm. You're right. It's like hunting. He use a, a gun now instead of using spears and dogs. But the fundamental principles are exactly the, the same. same. That's right. JP, we can talk the whole day about land. It's something that you're very passionate about. I know that for a Thank fact. Thank you very much. So we as the EFF, our second um, non-negotiable kernel pillar is nationalization of mines, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy. Earlier on, I asked you about the state of affairs economically in the country, mm -hmm. and you explained how we are in a bad financial situation in South Africa. Would you think that pursuing nationalization of mines, bank and, uh, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy will turn things around? Is that something that you would support? Yes, I would support that, and I'm not the only one. There are many people who support that. And let's go back to history. Africaners are where they are. They nationalize everything when yeah. they got into power. Right? There's not a single Africaner who had no job. There were many of them who were not very well educated, and we can still see even evidence of that even today. They found work for them. They build low-cost houses for them near the railway stations, right? So nationalization... Transnet right, did a lot of building right. those houses for white people. Yes. That today so, they can't build for black people. That's right. So basically I'm saying nationalization of the key sectors of the economy. Mm. There is no question about it. It is the way to go. I would support that. I would endorse that. And interestingly, that's where the ANC started. Yeah. And we spoke about land bank earlier on yes. and why people who are owing land bank, the state is not taking over the, the farms and whatnot. Would you support the move for a state-owned bank? I haven't given it a thought, but based purely on the analogy of a land bank, it has existed before and yeah. produced desired consequences. The land bank was a state-owned bank. That's my understanding. Yeah. There may have been a couple of other shareholders, but in the main, it was owned by the state and it financed various projects and farming operations of the Afrikaners in mm -hmm. particular. So I would support that. And quite frankly, anything that will bring back the dignity of the black people in this country. And I do believe having a, a national bank which will finance farming operations of black people, uh, farming, acquisition of farms, and transfer of skills, mm. particularly to black people. I think that institution is overdue. Yes, I would support that. So let's talk about state capacity. Um, is it worthwhile to pursue the capacitation of the state so that the state is able to produce and the people who live in the state consume what has been produced by the state? And will that then lead to employment being created and I mean we've got um, state companies that used to be state companies like yes. ISCOR who were employing a lot of people and um, now it's privatized and all that so would you do you believe in a building state capacity uh, I mean earlier on you spoke about yourself yes. how you yourself you are um, 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 taking care of yourself without buying anything outside would you think it's something that the state really needs to work hard on to, to, to pursue? Yes, definitely. The state needs to capacitate itself. And there are various ways of doing that. One is to improve the, 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 the capacity. The, the economy must grow, right? But I don't think the state on its own can capacitate itself. You need, obviously, a partnership with the private sector and us citizens of this country, right, including unions. But you cannot have a government that will be able to deliver right, all its promises if that government itself has not been capacitated in terms of having money. But I think, unfortunately, we've been borrowing a lot of money in this country of late. And uh, the problem with debts is that you are stuck in a cycle of debts. Mm. It becomes very, very difficult. But South Africa, if we were to share all the resources that we have as a country, there is more than enough 
to feed all of us. The problem is greed and wealth is concentrated in the hands of very few but filthy rich individuals. Uh, in the main, they are white, but we're getting a lot of filthy rich black people who should lead by example, uplift the communities where we come from. Some of these rich individuals don't even go to their rural areas just to spend quality time with people in the village and drive their expensive cars on those dusty roads where you and I go. I see. So linked to building state capacity, which would ordinarily lead to employment. Yes, right. Generation. Generation of employment. of employment. We're sitting here with a government or rather a state president who says it's not the duty of government to create jobs, but that of the private sector. What's your view on that statement? Well, I'm not here to criticize him, but uh, there is something called freedom of speech, which I'm exercising. Quite frankly, I do not agree with that. And I've just given an example. Our own government, when mm. it was controlled and owned by the Africaners, they capacitated themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. And that I understood to be the policy of the ANC when it started. Yeah. When the ANC started, certainly in 1994, I remember the very first speech that Mandela gave. He spoke with reference to nationalization. He was at the Grand Parade in Cape Town. But within weeks thereafter, he had abandoned that. He spoke about something else other than nationalization. So uh, I certainly think there, with due respect, the president is wrong. There is no doubt about that. The state, the primary responsibility falls upon the state to feed uh, its own citizens. The state alone cannot do that without the assistance and the help of the private sector who are going to blow in a lot of money. And obviously individual citizens of the country have to be responsible as well, not destroy the infrastructure which has been provided. I see. So I disagree with the president in that regard. Respectfully. Respectfully. He's wrong. JP, as you wrap up our conversation, we're heading to the 2024 provincial and national elections. What would you like to say to the people of South Africa? What should they be on the lookout for when you go to the polls? Maybe let me answer that question as follows. This is what I'm going to look out for. Yeah. I'm going to look out at the following things. The history of the party that I'm going to vote for. Are we being fooled again, right? Or is this party capable of delivering on its promises, right? You look at the history of the party, that's number one. Number two, there are a number of socioeconomic issues, some of which is health, right? We need to have healthy citizens. Education is a constitutional right that's very, very important. That's another aspect. I would expect a party or anyone to vote to see the policies of a particular party in respect of education. Four, transfer of skills. What is that particular party or any party saying with regard to transfer of skills, especially given that we have this skewed thing in South Africa where the whites in the main have all the skill ranging from uh, mathematics to farming and black people generally have no skills. So we need good citizens to come and assist and transfer skills, and black people as well who have skills. So I would want to see what is this party saying with regard to transfer of skills, but most importantly, transfer of the key sectors of the economy. I'm talking about mining, right? And mining goes far beyond just going underground digging, yeah. and digging and putting gold or coal on, on the surface. But the issue, what is the policy with regard to raw materials? Are we going to be a producer of raw materials for another 600 years in Africa? I would like to see... Beneficiation. Beneficiation as well, right? And basically, I'll be looking at that and uh, saying to myself, and then most importantly, the issue of land. If yeah. any party doesn't address land, this is me now, right? I will not even look, listen to that. So it's land, it is uh, health, it is education, it is transfer of skill, uh, it is transfer of the key sectors of the economy. Obviously, 
uh, uh, issues of violence, ending violence, is bread and butter. Every part will address that. But for me, I would like to look at the part that goes beyond mm. the symptoms. Because crimes of violence are normal, are symptomatic yeah. of our socioeconomic yeah. conditions. Once you address that people have their land, they have their jobs, they are responsible, you change their mind and the mindset. I recently said where, uh, one day where I gave a talk, one of the things that are problematic with us, you get the infrastructure after a few days when you want to ventilate our anger, we destroy it. Yeah. The mind and the mindset must change. We must begin to have a culture whereby we say we own South Africa. We have nowhere else to, to go. go. If we destroy our infrastructure, we're destroying ourselves. So that you can have a clinic in a rural area which will operate for 24 hours without the need to have any security. Because everybody in the community says, this is my clinic. That's an ideal world. We'll get there. But Maybe. we see, see uh, JP, I fully agree with you. We see a CEO of a state-owned entity mm -hmm. leading it to the dog. Yes. And then after that, he resigns and goes out of the country. And he buy, he buy, well, sometimes they buy shares. Sometimes they buy shares. Yes. So that's the current situation that we have. But thank you so much, JP. What's your hope for the elections? What do you think will happen after um, the elections? I don't know if it's going to be May 2024 or later, but... What do you think will be the outcome of the elections? It's going to be very interesting. There, there are many new players, right? And there are even individuals like former Chief Justice Mahoeng. I knew him to be a judge. I don't know his knowledge <laughs> of politics, let alone his contribution. But it's going to be very interesting. Uh, my concern is there are too many small parties, right? And there are just too many. They won't have much of an impact at the end of the day. Those small parties should seriously consider working with larger parties, especially where there is agreement on the core issues that the electorate should be looking for. But I do think in uh, South African politics there is a lot of pride in some of our leaders. I mean, how, why should you be happy to be the only member of parliament? Yeah. So Pride at times, but obviously there are parties. I'm not ridiculing them. There are parties which are playing a very important role, and you need them. PAC is an outstanding example. Sadly, there is only one MP of the PAC, to the best of my knowledge, but you can never wish the PAC alone because the message that the PAC stands for, which is undoubtedly the same message that EFF is standing for, is important. Yeah. So my prediction... Anything goes, and uh, anything goes, but I think there's going to be a lot of coalitions in certain areas. The problem with coalition parties is this. It is difficult to work sometimes, unless if you need a coalition, but you are controlling the majority. Where it's 50-50, it is exceedingly difficult. You end up with seesaw politics. I see. You see. But I predict there will be lots of coalitions, and it is my hope that South Africans are going to go out there in large numbers and vote. Firstly, they must go to register to vote. Yeah. That's important. On the 3rd and 4th of February. 3rd and 4th of February, everybody must go to vote, and voting is not done on social media. You don't win the election on social, on social media. media. Absolutely. So I would encourage all voters to go and vote according to their conscience, Firstly, register to vote and then vote and then bring about the kind of desired changes that you want to bring about. Come on, JP. 3 4 is register to vote. Yes. 10 Feb is manifesto of the EFF. Yes. We would like you to, uh, you know, encourage young people to come to the manifesto of the EFF, would, young and old. So I would encourage anybody to attend the political manifestos, be it that of the EFF, be it of the ANC. I would encourage anybody. Of course, I'm still the serving judge. I don't want to go to the Judicial <laughs> Service Commission. They will soon be saying, there is Klopper again. He's betting for the EFF, as if nobody should bet for the EFF. Okay. Thank you so much, JP. Uh, we really thank you for coming, taking your time out, um, coming to share your knowledge with us. We were taking notes as you're speaking. We've got rich knowledge that you impacted on us. We want to really thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Princess Mahutu. I take nothing for granted, and thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, all the best with the election. We can share the EFF water. We can share the EFF water and then cheers and then give my revolutionary greetings to the CIC. Will do. You can tell him I've taken over his headquarters. He's <laughs> not here. It's a coup. <laughs> Thank you so much, JP. Thank um, you for coming thank through. Thank you very much. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much to the people of South Africa, Africa, and the diaspora for watching. We've come to the end of our episode from the EFF podcast that was taken at Winima Dixela Mandela House in Johannesburg, South Africa. We want to encourage young and old people to come out in your numbers on the 3rd and 4th of February to flog the voting stations in your numbers to check your registration status, but equally to register to vote. Victory starts at the registration point. And of course, on the 10th of February, 2024, the Commander-in-Chief and President of the EFF will be delivering the manifesto of the EFF. We encourage everyone to come out in your numbers to join us at Moses Mabida Stadium, Deben in Kwasul Natal, where the president, the incoming president of South Africa, Julius Malema, will be delivering the commitments of the EFF to the people of South Africa. Stand up South Africa, make sure that South Africa you are counted with me, Run South Africa, stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF this country will be the better. EFF is a